Welcome to episode 78 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Liberty Dad, Dad Talk, and I've invited Jason Kavalik to have a chat. What's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot to none at all. This series is about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. And that means you may hear some dads discuss ideas that you or maybe even I disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Jason talks about moving away from libertarianism. Let's dive in and hear what he has to say. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thanks for being on the show. And thanks for being the first person for Liberty Dad, Dad Talk. Uh, kind of excited about this new series, and we'll just see how things go. So you are going to be the first, vict uh, first <laughs> person on this, uh, on this new series. And again, for everybody, what we're doing is um, I'm having people come on the show, dads, obviously, Liberty Dad, and we're just going to talk about whatever is important to them. So there's not really going to be an, I, uh, something that's important to me. Um, you know, I might be looking for specific topics, but I'm going to be looking for, you know, dads who have something that's on their mind that they want to talk about. And maybe it's about Liberty. Maybe it's not. I know I was talking to a gentleman and he said, I really like gardening. I don't know how we'll bring gardening into Liberty necessarily, or even if it will happen when I do that episode. But the idea is just to just to have a conversation, because I don't think there's enough dads out there having good conversation, maybe even dads that don't know each other. And so I thought, you know what, let's give it a shot and let's let's see how this goes. So, Jason, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, now, just for the record, I do know Jason from a while back. We met in Charlotte when I used to live up there at a church, which I don't remember the name at the moment, um, but we met at a church. And there was a small circle of friends and we would get together on a regular basis and hang out. And so that's how I know Jason. And uh, so again, Jason, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. It's been a long time. So tell me, what's going on with you? What's new? What do I not know about you now? <laughs> so now I live in Salt Lake City. So right. not in Charlotte anymore. Uh, moved here uh, two years ago. Um, you know, I think when I lived in Charlotte, I was, I've, I've been in benefit, you know, I've been in like call center work, customer service benefits, employer, employer benefits for, I think, you know, for a long time, mm -hmm. um, four years ago, I had the opportunity to move on to a tech startup in that space. And so two years ago, they decided, you know, Charlotte place, Charlotte area just wasn't, you know, North Carolina wasn't offering enough economic incentives. It wasn't a good growing tech hub, you know, financial services. Sure. Um, but, you know, a lot of technology companies were moving out to Utah, um, you know, with Park City and the Silicon Slopes. So um, my boss extended me an invitation to move out here to serve as a director in our in our support organization. Uh, so I took the plunge and now I live in Salt Lake City. Um, I've been a long time, you know, you know, personally, I've been a long time kind of rightish, you know, type person. You know, my grandfather was a Reagan Democrat. Mm -hmm. And I grew up, um, you know, in, in the Republican space, left the Republican Party in 2006, you know, got really interested in libertarian politics in the wake of like the John McCain campaign. Okay. And have, you know, really, you know, did my first pound in the door, going door to door, first um, donations in 2012 with the Ron Paul campaign, um, voted for my first third party candidate in that year and um you know really pursued that that type of thing uh, and now i'm almost becoming apolitical okay so what was it what was the draw then to the libertarian politics yeah i mean i think it's there's three things there's three real solid principles i still align with okay one is one is the idea of self-ownership right mm -hmm. i own myself I mean, I am a believer. You mentioned go to church. I, I I do believe that like I have a higher ownership, right? Spiritually speaking, but like in terms of like on this earth, there's no one has a higher claim to my life or me than I do. Okay. I mean, you can argue, you can argue the covenants I made with my wife and my children. I think I think there's probably a, a claim that you can make there, but I don't I don't think that 
you or anybody else necessarily has a higher claim to my life than I do. But, you know, I, so I, I, I see that as a valid like principle. Um, the idea of voluntary association, you know, not wanting to, you know, you should be able to associate with whom you choose, right? You shouldn't be coerced. You shouldn't be forced to hang out with people or associate with people outside of your, that scope. Um, and then, you know, non-aggression, I think, you know, the non-aggression po- policy or, or, you know, that idea of we're not going to use violence to enact politics. We're not going to use, right. I'm not going to initiate violence to get my way. I mean, I think all three of those things are really appealing and they're really, you know, and the base of it seem really like good ideas. Right. So are you cheating? Am I cheating? Yeah, because those are the exact three items that I list as fundamentals for libertarianism. So I think I think the challenge is if you take all three of those things, right, and you walk them out to their logical conclusion, you wind up mm-hmm. with anarchy, right? right. Anarcho capitalism. And I think that like that's kind of pie in the sky. It's impossible. Okay. Right. Like, I mean, are you, would you consider yourself an anarchist or would you consider yourself a minarchist? So I consider myself a minarchist in practice and an anarchist at heart. And just in case anybody's watching and they don't know these terms, an anarchist is basically somebody that doesn't believe in any government. We'll just, we'll just leave it as simple as that. And then a minarchist is somebody, for whatever reason, they believe that there is a need for some level of government. And it's generally well accepted that they leave it to, like, say, uh, basic services, so like fire and rescue, um, and then also the military, and then maybe a few other things, but but not much more. I mean, I mean it varies. It depends on who you talk to. Uh, so, so if you're listening and you, and you don't know those terms, it, basically that's what we're talking about. I mean, libertarians love to argue about the finer nuance, but that's sufficient. Um, so yeah, that's where I, that's kind of where I stand. Yeah. So what is it that um, you said it's pie in the sky and why do you think it's pie in the sky? I want to see where it kind of fits with how I think of it. I mean, for the same, I mean, for the same reason why like true Marxism is pie in the sky, right? Like this idea of, um, Utopia, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if, if you're, if, if you see, you know, Genesis as being, you know, some sort of biblical, the biblical kind of Genesis as being some sort of moral story or mythology or whatever, the idea is we got kicked out of utopia, right? The idea is that right. like we're, we've decided that our own um, morality was, was too important. So, and so we, we, we had that and then we decided that we wanted to understand that to the point that, w- that we lost it, right? And so for the same reasons, like we've, you know, why do we have to have, you know, let's start with a very base service, right? Like the, the courts. Okay. The, in, in a true anarchist society, you have no third party. You have no recognized true third party adjudication. Okay. Right. So you have to have some kind of recognized adjudication. So, so if you, if you and I are, are you, know, you know, if there's no state or there's no government, Who's going to govern if we enter into an agreement together mm-hmm. and, I, and, and I renege on that agreement or I, I backtrack on that agreement or, or vice versa? Who's going to govern that, right? I mean, with, without a court system, there, there is no basis for that, for the framework of that trust to be established. You know, at that point, then you're, you're forced to either say you lose out, right? And, and, and you can point to that person and say, well, that person is a bad person Mm -hmm. and hope that other people kind of catch on or you, that you, or you use force or violence or some kind of um, self-imposed action. Do you think it's possible to have a, uh, to have an anarchist society where you have maybe not an overarching singular judicial system, but if you and I were to enter into a contract then we would do so with like, say, a, th- a third party. And then that third party would basically be the governing party, right? And so if I reneged on the contract or, or if there was some issue with that needed resolution, then you or I could go to that third party and say, hey, we don't feel like the contract has been upheld. And so therefore I'm seeking you to do something. Do you think that would work? I mean, I don't see how unless unless you had a society where wherein both parties had 
sufficient collateral for that third party to hold Mm -hmm. to remedy the situation, right? So, you know, for example, you know, contracting on a house or something, right? So we go into contract on a house, you make, you know, you know, party A is the seller, party B is the buyer. So maybe party A warranties certain aspects of the house, you know, they would have to have certain collateral in place, um, right, to ensure that should those warranties, should should the buyer have to um, leverage those warranties, right? Um, that the seller had those things covered. Because what happens if the seller had those had, had that didn't have that covered, right? And I mean, I mean, if in theory, if we had, you know, a like some sort of like arbitrator who held that collateral, but now you're talking about you're having to hold up assets for an extended period of time through the life of that warranty. Right. You able to hear my son there? Yeah. <laughs> it's bedtime. So <laughs> the, the, you might, you might, uh, folks that are listening in, you, uh, you may hear the sounds of a little toddler. That would be mine, just <laughs> to be clear on that. So, uh, cause his room is right next to mine and it is bedtime. So he's getting ready to go and have his bath at any rate. Um, so yeah, that's interesting because one of the uh, one of the things that I talk about with Tub, who do, uh, him and I are doing this walkthrough on libertarians on 25 different issues. And one of the things that we've kind of come to terms with, or at least that we agree upon, is that one of the things that libertarians are no- notoriously viewed as is that they don't want to have certain things in place. And so they want to remove government and then there wouldn't be whatever it is that you know, whatever service that was being provided, however poorly, but whatever service was being provided simply would just cease to exist. And I said, I don't think that would be the case. I think it would be more along the lines of we would simply replace it with something else. So with, so instead, and that's why I asked that question, because that's one way I see that it might happen. And I, I could kind of envision, um, maybe rather than one singular court, one singular, you know, judicial branch, one singular um, executive branch that is responsible for enforcing, you know, whatever agreements, it would kind of all be rolled up into a, a kind of a single entity, you know, and, and, but there might be multiple entities, right? And so then you and I might agree, hey, let's go to entity A instead of entity B, because entity A has been, you know, well-established and they've got a, a good track record of, uh, of peaceably resolving disputes, whereas maybe B is a little bit, but, maybe they're cheaper, but they're, but they're not established. But if without a mechanism of enforcement, right? Like, is, I mean, I, that's ultimately what the state is. And, and I think, you know, I mean, I've talked about this before is the state really is just violence. I mean, that's really, that's right. really what the state is without that mechanism of enforcement. What incentive is there for the breaching party? Right to go along with whatever the third party, you know, arbitrator says. Right, and I guess that's what I'm getting at. They would be responsible for the enforcement. So I might, if I, if you and I were, if I was selling you my house, yeah, we might go to you know entity A, and we would both agree that if one of us doesn't uphold our end of the contract, or if there's a dispute that needs to be resolved, that this entity a had the final say and if we refused then they were permitted to use force in order to impose whatever outcome they determined you know i, I, I and i haven't really thought this well through i'm just kind of bouncing it yeah. off I, because they, i i tend not to believe yeah. that an anarchist society would exist for probably a yeah. little bit different reason yeah didn't they do that in the 50s in new york um I'm not sure, honestly. With the five families? With the what? With the five families? Oh, you mean like the mobs? Yeah. Um, they might have. And honestly, I would say that, uh, you know, there's a, uh, if you've never heard it, there's a thing called why the mob is better than the government, something like that. Somebody gave a speech at one of the Libertarian National C- uh, Committee um, conventions. And it's very, I can't remember who gave that speech, but I think it was a woman and she gave this speech and she gave like 10 reasons why the mob 
is like something like why the 10 reasons, 10 reasons why the mob is better than the government or something like that. And, um, and so it was very interesting. And I, I'm not going to try to remember all 10 yeah. of them or even a couple of them, but, um, you know, whenever I watch the mob movies, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of fiction involved as well, but it seems to me that, um, people generally follow through with the mob because they know that the mob will follow through on their end. Right. Not to say that the mob is necessarily a libertarian entity. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, in terms of understanding who you're working with and the severity of uh, breaching a contract, even inadvertently, maybe, mm-hmm. right. Even by accident. Um, but, you know, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure that's an interesting. That, that would be an interesting question to like dig up and just kind of review and just kind of see like, how did they run and how comparable would it be to how an anarchist society would view. And I, and I know there's a lot of things that would not be, I mean, obviously they violated the nap, you know, on yeah. a regular basis. So, so that's, that's certainly a yeah. problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, when the, the, I, yeah. and I mean, if they even existed, just, just throwing that out there. Yeah. 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 If, yeah, we're not saying the Costa Nostra actually existed. We're just saying, right. Pathetically. Right. I mean, I think, I think, I think the, the, the pragmatic or the reality is, is that, I mean, for the same reason why, like, in any power vacuum, right? Mm-hmm. And then that's what anarchy would. I mean, again, if um, if it would work, I, again, like that'd be great. But yeah, I think human nature would say, you know, you you would have a you'd have strong men rise up and and they would right. corner their areas. And you know, I mean, that I think that's really the the biggest reason why I don't I don't you know who because who who stops that right? Who stops the the guy with the most guns saying, well, this anarchy was fun but now you're all going to pay me tribute. Right. And, and I think my reasoning is somewhat similar. <clears throat> so my reasoning is, um, is actually somewhat biblical based, even though I'm not particularly religious these days. And if you remember, there is a, uh, there's a passage in the old Testament, and this is where the Israelites are insisting on that they want a King. And I believe it's the, the prophet Samuel, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I got that part right. But they're like, hey, we would like a king. And the prophet's like, hey, look, it's a good idea and all. But if you got a king, he's going to send you to war. He's going to tax you. He's going to do all these things. Basically, like everything that the government does now. Right. And so they're like, OK, yeah, we want a king. And he's like, are you sure? And so then they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We absolutely want a king. And so he's like, all right. And then he gave him a king. And then all those things happened. And so wh- one of the reasons that I if you look at scripture at, um, in a divine sense, then everything is divine. And so this is literally what's going to happen. So there's, they're speaking prophetically, right? Yeah. If you look at scripture and you say, ah, it's just a bunch of things that men wrote. Well, a lot of, I mean, there is fiction that's just far fetched, but there's a lot of fiction out there that is, that is rooted in some level of truth, a human behavior. And, my perception is that in those times, there was a lot more writing about perception of what was rooted in human behavior rather than just completely fabricating from the very from ground up. Right. Like, like, I don't really see a lot of manuscripts that you look back and you're like, oh, yeah, they just totally made this up. Like you look and you're like, oh, I can see where they might have seen elements of this in the day. So I look at it and I say, if nothing else then the writer was looking and they saw something in human behavior. And so I'm like, well, what did they see? In my opinion, what they saw is that people want an authoritarian figure, not necessarily quite the same as you, where you said, Hey, like there there could be this power vacuum and someone's going to necessarily fill it though. I don't necessarily disagree. Um, But more on the along the lines of, I think people like to outsource a lot of their responsibilities, responsibilities that libertarians say, no, that's your responsibility. You are responsible. And I think people want to outsource that. And, and the easiest way to outsource it is to find some authority to outsource it to. And then they keep outsourcing more and more and more. So I think to me, I look at it and I say, all you really need is a significant portion of the population that's willing to outsource their their responsibility to some centralized authority. And that once that authority it becomes large enough, it, be, it becomes a huge threat 
to everyone else. And I tend to believe that humanity falls along that line more so than they don't. So in other words, libertarians are, are, are anarchy, uh, the anarchist utopia, if you will. Um, I think that represents very, very few people, you know, like very few people in, 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 in humanity and that we are overwhelmingly outnumbered in that idea. And so that even if we were to establish an anarchist society, it wouldn't last long because you would have a very sizable portion of the population that would say, you know what, we're tired, we're tired of dealing with this, you deal with it. And then that authority would do what it always does. It grows and consumes and takes. So that's kind of my perception. What do you think of that? Does that sound good? Uh, no, I mean, I think it makes sense, right? I mean, when, if you look at this history of America, America was, you know, very much a decentralized country, right? Right. Where you had a federal government that really, when you look at the base of the constitution, you know, the federal government, you know, the Commerce Clause was basically there to ensure that we had one authority that said a pound, the mass of a pound in, in Georgia was the same as the mass of a pound in, you know, I mean, that, that was what the Commerce Clause was for, right? Right. To ensure that, like, you know, and, and we've seen that change. We've seen the meaning of that change. And we've seen that grow. And you've seen people clamor for this, right? You've seen people now clamor for the government to take over things like health care and stuff like that. And, and, and the problem is, is that, and while I agree with that, what you're saying, as we become a, a more integrated and complex society, how do you regulate those interact or how, how, how does the individual have the a power to regulate like these interactions where the power balance is drastically skewed towards the employer or towards the, the you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, for example, like I think we had a discussion online about OSHA, right? And you mentioned something about like, you know, if it's up to you, you get rid of OSHA altogether. Right. But how does, how does the employee navigate um, understanding what a safe workplace looks like without there being kind of a, a central authority. And I don't, and I understand that it doesn't necessarily have to belong to the federal government. I mean, like mm-hmm. IEEE is, IEEE is a, is a voluntary, it's, it's a, right. you know, we, we have that, we have that model. And I think if, if we use that model, that would be great. Right. And then, um, but employers don't do that. Right. So, right. so who, who establishes that baseline? So that the employee doesn't have to know the employee climbing the ladder doesn't have to know the the civil engineering science behind whether that ladder is going to support them or not. Right. Yeah, and I, and I, you know one of the things that I always point to is like a consumer reports or a unions, mm-hmm. which is weird because every Friday night we invite friends over and you know we have drinks and laugh and it usually ends up in you know my big mouth debating <laughs> half of everybody else that shows up. And um, I got into a conversation which turned kind of into a debate with a woman that had come over about unions. And it's weird because I I have some beef with unions, but on the other hand, I look at it and I say, you know, collective bargaining, people basically just coming together as a, you know, a free association, a group of people and saying, Hey, this is what we insist on this workplace. I'm very much okay with that. Um, You know, when you start getting into the politics, you know, like literally politics, then I start having issues um, and that's that's a different conversation. Um, so I look at it and I say, you know, that 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 would be one way that you could have it. You could literally have uh, a union. You know, you could have the um, engineering union that deals with whatever it is that's in that particular workplace, right? So your workplace would be potentially different than my workplace, and so we might mm-hmm. be in say different unions. Um, one that is familiar with you know, the concerns and, and the issues that you may be facing. And then I would be in one that obviously is dealing with mine. And, you know, there may be some similarities or there may be even just some flat out differences in how, how the same thing is approached. That's kind of, that's, that's kind of, you know, so I, I think there's, I think there's an opportunity there. I'm just, I'm not, on, it's not that I'm on board. Uh, I love, I have a good friend. He, he is, uh, he, he said once a long time ago, he said, when I become the statist, then it's a good time to have a conversation, something like that. And he's ba- he, he was a minarchist, right? So, and he was basically saying for anybody that's watching and they're like, hey, what's the status? What does that mean? You know, that's somebody that has a lot of affinity for government and government control, right? For, from our perspective, we're like, look, you want, like, this would be like the, the, the nice way of saying you love a nanny state, right? Like, that's kind of like the nice way of saying that. And 
Um, I, I, I think there's, you know, I think there's a bit of truth there that when he, when somebody like him or me, or maybe even you, because I think you, or it sounds like you're more of a minarchist type. Is, more is of a what? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, I would say, a minarchist was probably. You know, I mean, I was definitely never um, an anarchist. I mean, the first time I was exposed to the concept, I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work because right. you know, you're going to have you're going to have warlords and strong men, and I mean, just right. it will devolve like that. Right. And so, so I think that I think where was I going with that? I don't remember where I was going with that, but whatever. Uh, so let's move along here. So let me ask you. Um, I got. I got my next question is you are so so you you view the same fundamental ideas that i do mm-hmm. but i think you had told me that you were kind of moving away from libertarianism you told me a moment ago that you were becoming more apolitical so tell me what that means exactly well so i mean i mean looking at the last few political cycles right so you have mm-hmm. like in in 2016 there was never a time where the Libertarian Party had a better opportunity to at least get some traction, okay. right? Both on a national level and at a local level. Mm-hmm. You had from a from a from a really from a record. I mean, from from a just just a statistical record, like looking at the looking at the polling and stuff. Never had a two more unpopular candidates um, running for, for for national office, and I think. I think Gary Johnson only pulled in like what five percent of the national. Uh, I think it was somewhere between three and five. I always yeah. forget the exact number, but somewhere I think it, yeah. you know, it wasn't five percent because five percent would have put us into put the Libertarian Party into a uh, a major party status. I believe. I think that's yeah. correct. I believe five percent is gives them major party status. I, I could be wrong, so any Libertarians that are watching, feel free yeah. to take me to task. Right. And, and he dominated Bill Weld, who probably was um, not the best choice for vice president. Um, right. And, you know, I mean, like, you know, and then in, and then we get to this past time. And again, we I, I think one, the party itself is ineffectual because he gets locked in these like ideological struggles mm-hmm. of purity. Right. right. Um, you know, two. I, I think that it is the um, dumping ground of disaffected Republicans when the um, more mainstream or more um, yeah the more mainstream elements are in control of the Republican Party, right? Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is like like the Austin Peterson, the you know the people that like were really big Ron Paul supporters, like the anti-establishment libertarians who really kind of like after, you know, after Trump secured the nomination in 2016, jumped on the Trump bandwagon. Mm-hmm. Right. And I see them more as being just anti-establishment more than any. And so like, so like you, so dam- in a lot of ways damages the Republic, the, the libertarian party credibility, because there's like this, like you have like this, like it's like this dumping ground, whatever, anytime, like, you know, if if in 2016 instead of Donald Trump it was um, uh, Jeb Bush, then all those people who were anti-establishment Republicans would have glommed onto the Libertarian Party, if that makes sense. Okay. And so you're so saying you, we get a lot of leftovers. Yeah, and I mean, and and not not in a good way, right? So it's it's just it's it's just the people that are angry at you know the you know and, and they're not ideological. I don't say I mean I just touched just. Demean, demeaning or, de, or bemoaning the ideological purity, but it's these are people who aren't even really libertarian in nature. Period. Right. They just see libertarian parties being a rightist movement, okay. and say, "I'll just throw my cards in with them this time," because this other rightist movement. You know, does that make sense? Right. So, what makes you, what makes you look at when you're looking at the landscape and you're watching people? navigate or not navigate gravitate from the republican party to say the libertarian party and what makes is it just the fact that they're gravitating or is there something else that kind of makes you feel like we're presenting as a dumping ground kind of like almost to the point where we're inviting is there is there is it just the movement or is there something else 
I don't. I don't think you're. I don't think. I don't think Libertarian Party is inviting. I think. I think a lot of ways it's like they're like. Cash, I mean, oh, let me put it this way: in two thousand and in this past election, mm-hmm. um, there was probably the the um, you know the Libertarians nominated Joe Jorgensen, right? Right. When they had the opportunity and, and, and to, to nominate someone like a Justin Amash, right? Someone who he, was, he wasn't running. He, he he was not in the running. He but, was, but he dropped. Right. I mean, no, I mean he, he, nev- was, he never he never did. He never did. He had, I thought he had an exploratory committee. Uh, exploratory is not what I would consider to be running. He explored yeah. it and then took off. And there was tons of speculation as to why he did not put his name in the hat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but like they. I mean, if the Libertarian Party really wanted a candidate who really would have had a national poll, right? Mm-hmm. Again, he, there's no way he would have competed nationally against Biden or Trump. Um, but I think he would have at least commanded a lot more attention for the platform, okay. a lot more attention for the platform. He would have run, right? Like, I mean, like if, if Spike Cohen or the, whoever, whoever the chairman was at the time went to him and said, Justin, we would love for you to run on the party. We'd love for you to, you know, I mean, obviously they can't rig the, the nomination. This is the Democrats in 2000. Um, 16 for Hillary, but you know, I mean, I, I think that like it was, um, you know, I mean, he was the first libertarian member of Congress and yeah, he switched parties. He ran as a Republican, he switched parties, but he wasn't like, I mean, he was somebody who said, you know what, the Republican party has left their core values and, and, and I'm going, and, and really he was a libertarian the whole time. Right. Like, I mean, like, like, like fundamentally he was a minarchist. He was consistently a minarchist. Um, and, and, but we got someone who, was just had was an ineffectual campaigner, just okay. ineffectually communicating libertarian ideas. And I mean, I voted for her in the election, but like I wasn't excited about it. I mean, I was a lot more okay. excited about Gary Johnson four years okay. earlier than I was Joe Jorgensen because I, I people asked who you voted for. I said Joe Jorgensen. Who's that? Like people at least knew who Gary Johnson was. They looked when, at me like, you know, they're like, well, what about Aleppo? But I'm like, right. You know. When it comes to Joe Jorgensen, and and I don't mean to like look, we're not trying to trash Joe Jorgensen. But we are talking about a presidential nominee. So, what is it about her that you would have liked to have seen that you didn't? I mean, it needs to be. There, there wasn't. There's no national recognition. There's no national brand. Okay. Okay. I mean, there's no. There's no political brand. Like, there's before this. Before this campaign, no one knew who she was. Right. Right. Gotcha. Like, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, what was her experience other than? you know, being a business leader. I, I, I got you. Uh, my, my criticism is a little different. I honestly thought she was boring. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, there's that too, but I'm, I mean, I'm, she I'm had trying to, yeah. her, 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 well, I mean, you know, I don't want to trash anybody again. I'm not trying, that's not what we're here to do, but I am going to be honest. Cause I was a delegate and uh, I'll be honest. I did not vote for her. And when it came down to her and Jacob Hornberger, I was in a significant dilemma because my problem with Jacob Hornberger was I didn't have a problem with his message, but it just felt like all he kept talking about was how principled he was. And there was a particular question that really kind of frustrated me. And it, um, it, was, it was during some of the debates and somebody had asked him, they said, how will you communicate the message of liberty to a non-libertarian? And it was something along that line. And his answer was basically, you know, well, I'm principled and I'm going to tell him about how principled I am. You know, that's kind of how I received it. And I didn't like that. And I was like, no, mm-hmm. seriously, like, like, I can't take this to my mom. My mom, she passed away late 20, uh, like literally sometime after the election. No. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she, she passed away uh, shortly after the election. And um, she was Trump all the way. She was she was diehard Trump. And when I showed her, um, uh, this was Gary Johnson, by the way, not, not Joe Jorgensen. But so, so I'm thinking at Joe Jorgensen, I'm like, um, I, you know, and I'm thinking about, jo- I'm sorry, Jacob Hornberg. When, when I'm thinking about Jacob Hornberg, I'm like, I, you know, if my mom was alive, I would need to have somebody that was, w- that, that, that could talk to my mom, right? Somebody that would kind of break through that lens of it's got to be a Republican. 
And I felt like he wasn't giving me the answers that I wanted. I felt like Joe Jorgensen was a bit boring. And so I thought that she would be easily dismissed kind of, you know, the thing about Trump, like him or hate him, love him or hate him, is that when he answered, he kind of forced people to talk about him because of the things that he said. Now, I'm not saying that our libertarian candidates need to necessarily have that kind of decorum, but they need to have something that's, you know, gets people talking. And I felt like Joe Jorgensen, Joe Jorgensen had nothing. You know, she was boring. Now, her answers were great. I loved her answers on many, many things. You know, and I watched some of the uh, some of her campaign trail where she was out and they would videotape and people like people on the street would ask her questions. And I and I enjoyed a lot of her responses. I thought they were really good responses. But I thought she was just kind of boring. And I was just like, that, that's not very exciting. And, you know, I mean, unfortunately, we live in a time where um, people need sound bites and kind of excitement. I mean, you got to pep it up a little bit, you know, and, you, you, and, and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be crazy, right? Like, I think that's the, the misnomer. So people think right. it has to be crazy. And I'm like, no, it doesn't have to, it doesn't need, we don't need Donald Trump. Like no. he won because he was an anomaly. I don't think that everybody should follow suit. In fact, I think that would be a bad idea. Right. So, so that's kind of where I am. Um, but, but I, 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 vol- I voted for uh, uh, Jacob Hornberger, but then when Joe Jorgensen won, I was like, all right, well, this is the candidate. Uh, I'm going to be behind her. And I did my best to be behind her. I actually, uh, I, th- I felt like Spike Cohen was a much better communicator than she was. And I thought he was more interesting. And I thought he connected better. Connected, not necessarily this. I think, I think they had relatively, in many cases, a similar message. But I think he connected better. Because I watched some of his, you know, when he was like out at BLM protest. And he, like there was video of him talking to people. Mm. And they were just getting him. Right. So like it it seemed like he was connecting very well with everyday people. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, again, that makes sense. Like, you know, it's hard to take someone from obscurity and raise them to that level. I think it's one of the advantages that Gary Johnson had. Former New Mexican governor, Mm -hmm. um, somebody who is, you know, a Republican as as governor reelected in a, you know, blue state twice. you know, and, and, and really has the bona fides of a libertarian. Right. I mean, like, like, even though, I mean, he was fiscally conservative, you know, socially liberal, the things that like most Americans think of when you think of being a a libertarian Uh, and, you know, he just, for whatever reason, he failed to connect with the general electorate in, you know, both 2012 and 2016. And, you know, you had, and, 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 2012, I mean, you you had the re-election of Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. I kind of see that, right? I mean, the economy was in a good place. Um, you know, you had Romney, who was boring. I mean, he's my senator that's, now, so... That's putting it very yeah. nicely, because I thought he was yeah. terrible. Yeah, I mean, like, he's my senator now. I really didn't like Romney then, but at least he had the cojones to stand up to, stand up to Donald Trump. Um, so, you know, I gotta give him yeah, that. Yeah, but I'm going to push back on that one. He only pushed back. He never pushed back. That was my problem with him when he was running for president. He didn't push back. I watched because, you know, they, people, the media was like, oh, you're wealthy. And he's like, okay, okay, well, you know, I'm not really that well. It, it, it's, like, it's like he he wanted to kind of like temper everything. And I think that's what made Donald Trump so appealing is that the, like if you look back, you'll find out that one of the first things that the media tried to play was, oh, this man's, you know, he's rich. He's not like you. And Donald Trump came out and he was like, I'm rich. I'm really rich. Like he just embraced it. Right. And I think people loved it because he was not taking their BS. And I feel like Romney did. I feel like he just like every time they criticized him, he tucked his tail between his legs and he ran. And I'm like, no, for sure. No, for sure. Because I mean, nobody wants to follow that. I mean, I mean, look at, look at, I mean, look, look at the things that, I mean, I, I, I chart Donald Trump's ascendancy back to the first Bush, right. Um, you know, popular president coming off of war, you know, really successful war, um, you know, and, you know, the economy turns a little South and, you know, I mean, I mean, you have a candidate, you know, you, you basically have a, 
get into a debate between him and a and a, and a conservative governor in, in a in a southern state Democrat so conservative conservative southern governor of a Democratic state or of a Republican state, but Arkansas, right? Mm-hmm. And he calls the sitting president stupid, right? Like, I mean, you know, it's the economy stupid, like, like and and so. Like you think about all the things that they said, well, you know, that decorum that Donald Trump didn't have, right? Mm-hmm. And Donald Trump didn't respect the office of president. You had a, a presidential candidate calling the sitting president of the United States stupid mm-hmm. in a debate, in a televised debate. And, and, and there was no ramifications for that. There was no, like, you know, I think there was a time when I think we're in, and I think Republicans probably think back about this, that that, that should have ended Bill Clinton's career right there. Right. We're calling a sitting president stupid. Like, even if you didn't agree with him politically to have to, to, to attack a sitting president like that. And I think the American people or the Republican Party thought that that should have been dealt with through, you know, through, and that and it wasn't. It was rewarded. After that debate, Clinton's, Clinton shot up in the polls and he became elected president. And so, um, and then, you know, you, and, and so basically, I think, I think, and then you saw, you know, George Bush's son become president and you saw, you know, Part of politics society, you saw the same kind of like mean spirited attacks happen towards Bush, be tolerated, acceptable, and and I won't go into the stuff that the right said about Clinton because that some of that was you know like Vince Foster and stuff like that was nonsense too, but you know and, and so we started this cycle of like you know instead of it just being we disagree like you know this is my idea for how America should work. And, and being disagreeing with with this, you know, coming to the coming to the table with, you know, phil- philosophical disagreements and having debates on how to solve problems. But it's, it's now we're going to start to turn this into, I'm the good guys, you're the bad guys, and I have to not just beat you, but I have to crush you and grind your right party in, into dust. And I think that Donald Trump, you know, Republicans have, you know, since that point have always lost. We saw, we even saw, you know, we saw. Bush lost, you know, I mean, Bush lost after re-election with Katrina, which totally wasn't his fault, right? I mean, like the debacle there was the city didn't evacuate properly, the governor, the 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 mayor was corrupt, the governor was corrupt, right? And, you know, um, and but all that got pinned on Bush. Then you know you have you know you know the the financial crisis, all that was set in motion because you know our, our the underpinnings of our financial system are based on a debt dollar, you know, whatever. Again, not really, but and so I think Donald Trump get, get, sees this and he says, "Well, I'm not going to take that, and I'm going to fight back, and, and, and they're going to punch me. I'm going to punch them two times harder." And then you have a media that says, "Oh, hey, look at that. That's news, mm-hmm. right?" I mean, the day I mean, like he was polling in single digits until he basically um, called out Megyn Kelly for like you know her monthly cycle, right? right? Like, right. and that's when like. Everybody just started focusing on Donald Trump and that's when he took off. So I, I think you're right. I think I, I don't doubt that like Donald Trump's, you know, him and his attitude is got him there. Right. Like that, but you know, but I, but, and I, and Romney was boring. What I was saying, what I liked about Romney is that at least like he was willing to stand up and vote to impeach Donald Trump when okay. other Republicans weren't. Gotcha. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, what was the thought that I had? I, I was trying to think of the thought. I, um, I, I, I find it interesting that um, we, well, you know what? This is what happens when you come home and you drink some wine before you eat. You tend to lose your thought. And that's what happened. I'm going to be honest here. But we'll move on. Um, so... <laughs> A little embarrassing there, but hey, you know what? It happens to the best of them um, or the somewhat best, I guess. I don't know. At any rate, so where does this put you? So you, we're talking about you moving away from the... So are are you or were you ever a Libertarian Party member? And were yeah. you active? Okay, were you active? Um, yeah, so I was active. And so like I like Sean Hall, I was active in his campaign. And, and so he ran for Senate in North Carolina a couple of times. Okay. Um, and when was that? Because I'm not terribly familiar. Um, that was a long time ago. I'm getting old. Probably before 2017, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was when I okay. lived in Charlotte. So it was like, gotcha. it was like, I think it was like 20, 
I mean, he ran for for senator a couple times. He had these videos where he was drinking beer. It was before Elizabeth Warren did it. Gotcha. So he's, he's, he's I bet he didn't lose his train of thought either, did he? No, he didn't. Yeah. See, this uh, is why I can't be a candidate. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't really come into the movement until about 2017, and then I kind of slowly crept in. I crept in more at the local level, and then kind of slowly worked my way to the state, and then eventually jumped into the more national level. Yeah. So I probably didn't get to the national level until. I don't know, maybe 2019, 2020. And, and then I was just kind of barely kind of etching along, just kind of, you know, kind of taking a peek, seeing what was out there, who's out there. Don't really know anybody, don't really know anything. So um, so so where are you now then? Because we've established that you that you identify with the three pillars of libertarianism as I describe them. And that would be the non-aggression principle, the freedom of association and self-ownership. And in my opinion, those three things for everyday people are going to answer pretty much most every question that we're going to have right now. There may be some nuances somewhere and maybe we need to dig a little deeper, but I think it's just in terms of understanding the world around us and kind of applying libertarianism in a relatively simple way. I think those three will do it. So you've identified with those. Um, you were a libertarian party member, mm. and then now you're moving more toward apolitical. So what's moving you toward apolitical, and how does that impact you as a dad? Yeah, I mean, like I think, I mean, I think one, like, I think COVID's been a big part of that, right? Mm-hmm. And we've had some conversations about this, like, you know, I, I, I see, you know. I've always valued the idea of personal responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. And and I don't see right solution. I don't see the solutions coming from the Libertarian Party other than like personal responsibility, right? I don't see there being personal responsibility solutions. Like if 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 you're sick and you get someone else sick, there's no way to know that you got someone else sick. There's, I mean, like like how do we manage like through a how does libertarianism manage through a pandemic? So I think there are instances and there are times when libertarianism doesn't offer a decent order okay. to how to navigate certain things. Not, you know, not, and again, I'm not talking about like status quo. I'm not talking about normal. I'm saying like, you know, when, when health officials are demonized because they're trying to find, they're trying to encourage people to engage in behavior that as far as the best science and the science sucks, right? Mm-hmm. I think, I think we all agree the science sucks. The NIH spent 10 million, only spent $10 million in all of 2020 in COVID research, right? I mean, that's, you know, we think about the NIH budget, we think about the budget of the federal government, you think mm-hmm. about the greatest health crisis that, I mean, since AIDS, uh, since, since HIV, in, in, our, in my lifetime anyway, um, to only spend $10 million on that when they're dumping trillions of dollars into the economy, right? It's like, it's like we're going to shut down the economy, we're going to spend tens of years and trillions of dollars to, to stabilize the economy while we shut it down, but we're only going to spend $10 million researching things like masks or researching things like, you know, are masks effective, right? Or researching okay. things like social distancing, right? Like it's just, that's ridiculous. Um, I mean, I would say I'm looking for like pra- pragmatic governance, right? Like, you know, um, you know, locally here in Utah, I think we've struck a decent balance between protecting individual liberty while also ensuring that like, you know, the, the leaders, the political leaders are, are really clear about, you know, take this seriously, listen to the public health officials, that sort of thing. Right. Like, like there is a level of moral, moral leadership that they're displaying, even though they're refusing to succumb to the pressures of other, you know, whether it's the Biden administration or other States that are, have really, you know um, I think you're talking about, you know, oppressive leaders, you know, I mean, so I, I think I think there's that too, right? Like, I think there's a lot that political leaders can do without mandates, right. I guess. So I'm looking for that, if that makes sense. A lot more okay. moral leadership, and you know, and saying, you know, what, I'm not going to make you wear a mask, but the best science says if you wear like a KN95 around people that are older than you or around people who might be high risk, it might keep them from getting it, right? Like that's the kind of thing I'd be looking for, if that makes sense. Gotcha. And and are you seeing that anywhere? Is there a, a particular party or a particular direction that you're seeing it that you're like, hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for? No, I'm not, I'm I mean not 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 wholesale. There isn't like a group that's doing it, right? So you've got okay. you've got the left who's like, you have to wear masks, you have to wear masks. And then you see like Gavin Newsom partying it up with like, you know, party leaders and you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, and without masks, no social distancing, 
hugging each other and like pecking each other on, you know, whatever. So, so, you, so you have that hypocrisy, right? Right. You see, like, you see the, the, the Republican party in, I mean, almost take like a, picking up where like the Trump left off and say, you know, this, this is just kind of intentionally politicize something like, like say, you know, and then, I, and then, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, like the FDA or, you know, the libertarians are always like, well, we should, we should just abolish the FDA, right? Get rid of the FDA. I mean, if we didn't have the FDA, these, these vaccines would have been out, you know, six months earlier, eight months earlier, people would have been able to take them on their own. But then you have, you know, the libertarians are almost like, and these, these ones I've seen online, there's some that have taken it, there's some that have been vaccinated right. and have encouraged others to take vaccines. There's some that are like, not even like, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, not, I'm neither going to encourage nor discourage people from taking it. People that are, pushing forward like misinformation and you know so i mean it's again like i i think you can have moral leadership without and 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 moral leadership is the courage to say things that aren't necessarily popular um without saying you should have to do this okay that makes sense so what would be the give me an example i'm gonna put you on the spot here if you don't mind give me one thing during COVID that you would have liked to hear the Libertarian Party come out and explicitly say? Um, I mean, I would have liked to have seen like the Libertarian Party come out and say, um, I mean, I, I think engaging on like mistruths about vaccines, for example, I think it would be a really good one. Right. Okay. So like, like there's a lot of mis like mRNA vaccines, right? So the Pfizer and Moderna, you know, there's a lot of, those are about, those are understandably newer technologies, right? So there's a lot of misinformation. These have never been tried in humans before. Well, that's, that's a misstatement. mRNA has been used in humans trials, clinical trials for about 10 years now, not for COVID, but for flu, for Zika, for, for, you know, for, for other things. Mm -hmm. So to say that like, well, this is, Brand, it is brand new technology. There isn't these two vaccines. Like Pfizer was the very first mRNA vaccine that was approved by the federal government. True, but but there is but but we but we have used this type of vaccine in clinical trials for about ten years now. You know, so so that's one that that's one clear cut example where there is a a common like misstatement or a mistruth or a truth that or something that's be, being spoken that isn't true. That could easily be cleared up, um, and I, I don't see that kind of leadership. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then another question that I have, because we're we're, we're coming up uh, close to our time, we want to try to keep this within an hour. And because we are both dads, I'd be interested in hearing how, and, and, and it may not be applicable, but just just do your best. How you might see your political views or the changing of your political views in terms of what does it mean for you as a dad, right? And that can go anywhere you want. Yeah. I mean, I think for me as a dad, you know, I want my son to be compassionate, Mm -hmm. right? I want my son to see people and have empathy for them. Right. And, and, you know, I don't, I I want him to think of how can I help people? Right. And, and how can I, how can I make this world a better place? And not just for me and not just for my kids or not just for my own, but how do I, how do I make this a better place? And, and I think part of it is, you know, I don't want him to be like, well, we need to have like social programs, you know, mandated social programs, whatever. You know, part of the thing I like about my job is that, you know, is, and the reason I, I left like, you know, kind of a stable Midwestern, you know, company and to go in this like tech sector is that we really are trying to change healthcare mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's through the employer system. So it is a cap trying to fix what's helping people navigate and have transparency around you know, a system that has no transparency. So it is a, a capitalist way, a capitalist approach to fixing healthcare. So, it's, I mean, it is that like, like, how do we, how do we make capitalism um, and make it more compassionate? How do we, or how do we bridge the, the gulfs of like the areas of capitalism that can be abused and, um, and, and make it, a, and make it transparent for people so they can engage properly within society. And I mean, I hope that he sees me as someone who says, you know, he's someone who believes in a system enough that he will 
his life work is about um, making it work responsibly. Awesome. Awesome. Any questions for me? I mean, um, no, I mean, I, th I think, you know, uh, you, you know, you said you've moved into libertarianism. I don't know where you came from, you know, but how do you see that as impacting your, your raising your child, your son? Good question. Uh, and I should have expected that one. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, I grew up a, you know, kind of an evangelical Republican and mostly my Republicanism was my parents' Republicanism. So mm -hmm. I kind of just hit the R all the way down originally, you know, when I was, you know, early, early on when I first could vote. And then eventually um, I, I kind of more identified with Republicans, but I started realizing that I didn't quite identify with them, but I didn't really know anything else. Like there was, there was no, like, maybe I should check out this party or that party. I didn't really, all, all I knew was the big two. So I just kind of kept with it for a while. And you know, I'm not even sure how this occurred, but I remember when I lived in Indiana, I came home one day and I think I've been listening to talk radio or something. And I told my wife, I said, my, this is my ex-wife. And I told her, I said, I think prostitution should be legal. And it was kind of out of nowhere. <laughs> and so is that of, why she's your ex-wife? <laughs> no, not quite. But, uh, you know, she really didn't take well to it. Let's put it that way. Right. And, and at the moment I was just like, I don't see why you're getting so upset here. Like what's going on? I just, just said this idea. Like this doesn't even, you know, I, I don't understand why you're getting. So and after a few moments of uh, conversation, I realized it kind of came out because it was out of nowhere. Right. Like I wasn't coming home talking about like new ideas that I learned. I wasn't talking about some book that I had read. I just, I, I don't know what I was just like, I think this should happen, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, what? And so I realized what she heard was, I think prostitution should be legal because I might like to try it. <laughs> and so then when I realized that, I kind of walked it back a little bit and I said, you know, I, that's, that's not what I'm getting at. I, and then I explained it. I said, it's currently legal for two people to meet and go home with each other. There's nothing legal about that as long as they're consenting adults. And I said, but if one person says, you know what? That was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Here's ten dollars because you know, I mean, I got to give you something, right? Then all of a sudden it becomes illegal, and so for me at the time I was just like that. That doesn't even make sense. Like, why would it be illegal? Because it's the same action. I just happen to choose to tip you or whatever the case may be, right? And um, and and then from the evangelical perspective, I was like, it's still the same immoral action. The only difference is now we're exchanging money. So once we calm that down. I just kind of continued on listening and observing and, you know, maybe reading here and there. And eventually I came to the conclusion that I felt like the Republican Party really didn't represent me because I believed more uh, in the line of personal freedom and then personal responsibility. And but when I say personal responsibility, that's more like saying, hey, you make a decision. You need to live with the consequences. Not because I think when a lot of people hear personal responsibility, they think of some sort of obligation. I don't look at it like there's an obligation. I say, look, you have a personal responsibility. That means that whatever choice you make, because you're going to make one choice or the other, or you know, one of many, and there's going to be a consequence, good or bad, and you will have to deal with those consequences. Um, and so, scroll forward where I am today. Eventually, I did end up become you know finding my way to the Libertarian Party. And one of the first things that I saw was I was like, oh, my God, the messaging is just like it's terrible. You know, like there was just so much like I felt like there was a lot of arrogance and there was just kind of like a lot of, um, uh, you know, people unwilling to be patient with non-libertarians. And I said, this isn't going to work. Like, how are you going to spread these ideas? And so I kind of took a cue from my days back in the evangelical movement where one of the things that we learned was. You got to meet people where they are. And even church people weren't so good at that. I mean, we talked no. about it at least, but we weren't necessarily good at it, right? It was just kind of this weird contradiction. Like we talked about it and then we went out the door and then failed it consistently, in, in my, at least from yeah. my experience. And so I said, you know what? Somebody has got to show these libertarians how it's done. And then I said, I'm going to do it right after I learned myself.
<laughs> and, <laughs> and I literally joined Toastmasters explicitly so that I could learn how to better communicate. And I started studying more about communication. So you'll find, I get into debates with some of my fellow libertarians and virtually you just pick a libertarian. It doesn't matter. You find one that follows me, you pick them. They've probably almost guaranteed read more libertarian literature, more philosophy than I have. And, but on the other side, I have been exposed to, watched, listened, read, you know, I've engaged with more material about interacting with people than most of them have. And so today to get, you know, to kind of bring that back to the original question, how does that affect with me and my son? I want him to, to be able to engage with others, knowing that today's conversation this is kind of my tagline. Today's conversation is really only setting up for tomorrow because yeah, maybe today you and I have a conversation and I disagree with you on some things and that's okay. And I think that's the first problem that we have to overcome. We have to think it's okay that this person disagrees with me. It's so like, if we really want to be arrogant, it's okay that they're wrong. It's okay. You know, and then say, I want to make sure that this interaction with this person is pleasant enough so that later they'll want to engage with me. And I got that when I was thinking about my son before he was born, I was just like, you know, kind of like, what kind of dad do I want to be? And I was like, well, I know that I'm going to teach him a lot of things. And then one day he's going to go out into the world and he's going to experience something other than what I taught him, or he's going to learn something other than what I taught him. Right. And then he's going to come yeah. back hopefully, and then say, dad, what's up? How come you didn't tell me about this? You know, or, Hey dad, what do you think about this? Right. But what's going to stop that is if I'm not approachable, if I deliver to him in a way where it's just like, God, I, I, I'd love to ha hear what dad has to say. Maybe he's a, you know, maybe I think he's a smart guy, but he's such a pain in the butt. I don't want to have to deal with that. Right. So to, to me, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how wise you are, what great answers you think you have. If somebody has a poor interaction with you, all of that smartness, all of that wisdom, all of that knowledge, it goes right out the window because more often than not, you're just going to upset people. So I want my son to really engage with people. Now, ultimately, I want him to identify with those three things that we talked about throughout the show, which are, you know, the non-aggression principle, freedom of association, and then um, uh, for, uh, I always forget the self-ownership. Uh, self-ownership. Yeah. I, I always, it's funny. I, every time I talk to somebody, I always nail two of them different two at the time and then forget the third one, whatever. The I'm the same is. way, but I always forget freedom associations. I actually have a note card in front of me. So I have remembered them. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I need to make an acronym somehow. So I'll remember them. So I'm going to, I'm, yeah. I'm that's going to be my, like, my new project, but ultimately I want him to identify with those. Right. And I want him to be the kind of person that, um, that more importantly hears and listens to other people, because I believe that when we hear somebody, we usually hear, the surface. We do mm. not hear what's underneath. And the good example of that, just to be really quick here, is that if, um, let's say I come home one day and my wife's really upset. And I'm like, dear, what's wrong? And she goes, uh, <laughs> she says, you are, oh my goodness, my battery's running low. We may get, we may get cut off here because I forgot to plug my laptop in, but we'll, we'll deal with it. So um, if, if, if she, she might come home and I say, or I might come home and she might say, hey, you know, we never go out anymore. And then I might go, well, we went out last week. Well, that's not what she's saying. What she's saying is we don't go out. We, we go out so infrequently that it feels like we never go out, even if we did just recently last week. Right. And I feel like that's what we need to figure out. We need to figure out what people are actually saying to us. So that's what I want from him. And, and hopefully that that intertwines with liberty and he becomes, you know, a, a way better libertarian than I ever thought about being. And that's, that's my sorry. hope for him. Yeah. That's a good hope. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me an email to LibertyDadPodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to Facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows prefer an audio format then head on over to libertydad.com or just search for liberty dad all one word on your favorite podcast app remember 
If you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.